So today is just a continuation of the hemoglobin series. So the first one was structure and synthesis. And then the second one was the dissociation curve. So today we are going to talk about death, okay? How hemoglobin gets recycled and what happens to an aging RBC. Um, so it's about intravascular hemolysis and extravascular hemolysis. So it's RBC, aging, and death. So a quick trivia for you. The RBC actually travels 200 to 300 miles during its three-month lifespan. So every three months, we produce new RBCs to replenish those that are expiring or the ones that are not good anymore. So first things first, we're going to discuss extravascular hemolysis first. So extravascular hemolysis does 90% of RBC destruction by phagocytosis through the reticuloendothelial system, RES, or the mononuclear phagocytic system. And this happens in your spleen. Okay, so the hemoglobin in the RBC splits into the iron, protoporphyrin ring, and the globin chains. That's what happens um, during destruction. And then the globin chains just goes into your amino acid pool. It just gets reabsorbed in the amino acid pool of your body. So it just waits till it gets recycled to do something else. And iron in the RBC gets picked up by transferrin and it goes to the bone marrow. And in the bone marrow, it is used and recycled to make new hemoglobins, and that's it. But for the protoporphyrin ring, this is going to be a little longer. So the alpha carbon gets exhaled as carbon monoxide. And then when that's gone, it becomes an open tetrapyrrole called biliverdin, which becomes bilirubin. Then bilirubin gets picked up by albumin and travels into the liver. And then in the liver, bilirubin becomes conjugated bilirubin or bilirubin glucuronide. Then after this, it goes down into the intestines where it gets bacterial action and then the conjugated bilirubin gets converted into a urobilinogen. And then after that, it goes into your stool. Some of it will show up in your stool or some of it will be reabsorbed by the body and filtered through the kidneys. And so part of it, if you have a lot of urobilinogen, would still show up in your urine. But that's pretty much it. That's extravascular hemolysis. Okay, so that's not too bad. Now let's focus on this part because this is pretty important. So once the bilirubin gets picked up by albumin, it goes to your liver. Okay, so before the bilirubin reaches the liver, it's called unconjugated bilirubin. And another term for that is indirect bilirubin. And now when it gets to the liver, it gets processed and it becomes conjugated bilirubin. Or, in other words, direct bilirubin. Now these guys are important because it tells you the amount of hemolysis. Doctors can actually order this as a test, direct bilirubin, and so they get an idea of the amount of hemolysis that's going on in the patient. So that's an important clinical chemistry concept and you should remember this. So let's move on to intravascular hemolysis this time. So intravascular hemolysis accounts for 5-10% to 10 of RBC destruction. So it's nothing compared to extravascular earlier where it accounts for 90%. This one's just 5-10%. to 10 And it happens in your blood vessels. So when it breaks down, hemoglobin gets oxidized into methemoglobin and then it gets picked up by hemopexin. And then it goes into the liver for further processing. And then the alpha and beta dimers of the hemoglobin gets picked up by haptoglobin. And then the haptohemoglobin complex is, um, is kind of a big 
complex, <laughs> so it doesn't get excreted by the kidneys. It can't go through the filter. So it stays in your body instead of getting out through your urine. So it stays there and it gets reabsorbed and then it gets taken into the liver. And then after that, it just gets processed similar to how we saw the extravascular hemolysis processes in the liver. <clears throat> so now let's focus a little bit more on this side, the haptoglobin, haptohemoglobin complex. So as the haptoglobin gets consumed, if you have a lot of alpha and beta dimers in your body floating around, so eventually your haptoglobin gets consumed and then the excess hemoglobin shows up in your plasma and that's called hemoglobinemia. And then kidneys could actually reabsorb that up to 5 grams per day. But after that, it's going to show up on your urine. And then when hemoglobin shows up in your urine, it's called hemoglobinuria. So both hemoglobinemia, when it shows up in your plasma, and hemoglobinuria, when hemoglobin shows up in your urine, only happens, so this is important, if there's so much intravascular hemolysis going on already. And that only happens, you know, in like hemolytic anemias, when, you're, when your RBCs are just bursting in your vessels. Okay, but usually intravascular hemolysis is only limited to haptoglobin, only this step. It doesn't usually go all the way here in hemoglobinemia and hemoglobinuria. That only happens, again, on excessive intravascular hemolysis, such as in hemolytic anemias. Okay, so to sum it all up, we're just going to put each of them side by side. So extravascular versus intravascular hemolysis. So where does it happen? For extravascular hemolysis, it happens through phagocytosis in the reticuloendothelial system, the RES, and while the intravascular hemolysis happens in your blood vessels. And remember, extravascular accounts for 90%, while intravascular only does 10, 5 to 10% of hemolysis in your body. And then the measurement. So for extravascular hemolysis, it's measured through the indirect and direct bilirubin in your plasma. And intravascular hemolysis is measured through haptoglobin amount, hemoglobinemia, and hemoglobinuria. And lastly, I wanted to leave you with the fact that your liver is really important, so please take care of it. So the notes for this lecture will be posted up on my website, so check that out. And that's it. We're going to end our lecture here. And I hope you learned something today. Bye!